right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're looking forward to talking to you tonight about building wealth through investment properties. I'm Rob Wachter, and this is the first of what will be a series of shows we're going to do once a month on different topics in real estate, on ways to help you uh, build your own portfolio, understand the real estate market, learn how to buy that house for the first time, or some more advanced things, whether you are considering retirement, looking to downsize, or maybe just ready to take advantage of this crazy market. So we are looking forward to having you as part of this event, and we encourage you to tune in. Um, if you are watching this pre-recorded, please feel free to send us questions, uh, call us, We'd be more than happy, message us, we'd be more than happy to answer any of your individual questions. We will be taking questions at the end of this event and we look forward to talking with you. All right, as again, as I said, I'm Rob Wachter and I am the team leader of the Wachter Group. We are a team inside of the real estate firm, J Park Carolina Living. Um, I've been the president of the Wachter Realty Group uh, for about seven years now. Uh, we are licensed in North and South Carolina. I've got 15 years experience as a, as a banker and a financial advisor before I got into real estate. I've been doing real estate now well, since probably 2009 or 10 full time. Um, and I've got a team of agents, as you can see in the picture, that works with me. Uh, one of these agents is co-hosting with us tonight, Casey Hart. And uh, Casey, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit about me. I moved from the Boston area about four years ago to Charlotte. Um, and I joined the Walker Group last year. I specialize in helping buyers find both their forever homes as well as investment properties. I'm really excited we're doing this today because I think by the end of it, uh, a lot of people are going to see how just one or two investment properties can really help secure um, retirement as well as financial freedom. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Casey. Um, and as we will in each of these event events, we are going to bring a subject matter expert in today. And today our funding financial expert about all things mortgages is Stephen Knorr. I've known Stephen and his dad, Dave Knorr, for many years and worked with them on countless number of deals. And I look forward to Stephen bringing his expertise to this event. Stephen, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Rob. I uh, appreciate you having me. And uh, likewise, I think this is going to be a good uh, event for everybody to hopefully learn a bit, a little bit of information. Um, I've been in loans for 15 years. Uh, my dad's been in loans since dinosaurs roamed the earth is his joke. So We've got a little bit of knowledge between the two of us and, um, you know, we'll definitely talk about that as we move through the program. But right now um, we run the NOR Group, which is a division of Alcoba Mortgage. Our main office is in Harrisburg. Uh, I also have a team that works with me and we have another team of loan officers. Um, so I'll be able to speak from the point of view of, of a loan officer, a branch manager. Uh, we own a broker company. We merged it. So I've seen and done just about everything in the mortgage world. Um, you'll see on the bio there, I also am a little bit of an entrepreneur and, and have a couple different businesses. Uh, one of them is a salon in Harrisburg. I wore a hat and was planning on getting a haircut and a beard trim today before the event, but that didn't happen. So uh, even the owner can't squeeze in when the girls are booked up. So you got this ugly mug. But um, I also have a, a company called Norlock Homes and I, I flip properties. Uh, I have an investment group that holds companies, rentals, and then uh, uh, actually a racing LLC, which is uh, not a profitable business, but it's fun. So I've got a lot of different things that we can talk about. So thanks again for having me, Rob. Sure. Thanks, Stephen. All right. Um, today's topics, we're going to cover a number of things, but it's all related to building wealth through investment property. So we're going to talk first about why you use real estate to build wealth. Uh, then we're going to talk about renting versus owning and the differences. Uh, we'll do a little bit of finance education, the effective time on money. Uh, we'll look at the specific impact of buying one investment property and what that impact that can have to your financial future. Uh, and then Stephen will talk about the buy, occupy, and rent strategy, um, how to convert your primary home to a rental, uh, how to build that portfolio by repeating the process. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. Uh, and we'll talk about what if you just want to go straight out and buy an investment property directly. These are all uh, topics that we'll address today. And again, if you have questions, start submitting them uh, in the Facebook comments or in the, uh, the chat here in Zoom. So 
first question people often ask is why use real estate to build wealth? Isn't that just a place to live? And while that's certainly true, that's one of the things that makes it really valuable for building wealth. If you poll the, the wealthy people in this world, 90% of the world's millionaires have done it through investing in real estate. Uh, real estate is unique compared to any other type of investment. Uh, for one thing, the supply is finite, it's limited. They're not making any more of it. Um, real estate is useful for a basic need. No matter what happens to the economy, no matter what is happening in your life, everyone needs a place to live. Um, real estate is handy because its value tends to increase over time. And most people that finance real estate have a monthly payment. And the good news is every time you make that monthly payment, the balance on that mortgage goes down just a little bit. So while the value goes up, your debt goes down building equity. Um, you can grow um, value in real estate on a tax deferred basis, which means you're not getting a bill every year from the, the government um, when you're necessarily when you're uh, having that value grow. Um, if you, your needs change and you want to switch from one type of rental property to another, you can exchange that property without uh, necessarily triggering an income tax event. Um, there are many other tax benefits that I'm going to just simply say, please consult your tax advisor because we're not tax professionals and each person, each company, each way they do things are going to have slightly different benefits. And of course, income increases with time and cost of living. And we're going to give you some examples of that. So the first thing we'll talk about is owning versus renting. And I want to do a really quick 10 year illustration. There are a lot of people that graduate high school, graduate college. They say, I'm not really ready to own a house like my parents did. Um, I just want to rent for a while. So let's just say for, you know, someone that rents the equivalent of a $200,000 home, it could be a three bedroom house, could be a two, three bedroom apartment, very similar in price, but a $1,700 a month rent. Uh, if you did that for 10 years and factored in what probably is a 4% annual increase in that rent, you're going to pay approximately a quarter of a million dollars in rent over 10 years. Granted, you won't have any liability, but for the benefit of all those payments, you own exactly nothing. If you owned a property by purchasing that same property for $200,000, and your monthly payment would be approximately $1,200. That makes some assumptions of where you are and, and putting about 5% down. But doing that after about 10 years, you will have only paid $151,000 in payments. So that's almost a $94,000 savings in your cash flow. And the beauty of that is after that 10 years, not only have you saved that money, but you own a piece of real estate that's likely to have about $125,000 worth of equity at that point. Now we're going to quickly go through a little bit of finance and the effect of time on prices. Um, I think this can be especially powerful for young people who maybe you know, haven't experienced a long period of time and the price increases that go along with it. So here's just a, a quick example of what the cost of things were 30 years ago from today. You know, eggs were 69 cents a dozen. Rent on a two bedroom apartment, you know, a decent one, especially in Charlotte, was probably running about 350. The Dow Jones Industrial Average for us stock investors was right at about 3,000. Median household income was just a hair under 30,000 household income. And the median US home price was at about $117,000. So as you can see, 30 years flashing ahead, those prices have all gone up, some things far more dramatically than others. But what that does is it shows that the value of things increase significantly over time. Now we're going to look at that in the, in the way it affects housing prices. And we're going to look, use just a 10-year snapshot. And those last 10 years have been, been pretty interesting in this market. If you look at a, a house that 10 years ago in this market cost $200,000 to buy. Today, that same home would sell for about $360,000. Now, please remember that's different in different markets. Some neighborhoods have had greater growth than that. Some have had less growth than that. That's not a guarantee. That's a, an apps, you know, across the board estimate. And conversely, rental prices have increased, you know, roughly about the same amount. So that you've seen about an 8% per year increase over the last 10 years. Now, 
we're going to show you in a minute the the illustration of what, what buying one rental property might do to your finances. In doing that illustration, we're going to assume just a 4% per year growth in price of the property and a 4% per year growth in specific expenses like taxes, insurance, things like that. We want to be conservative so that we're not, you know, pie in the sky showing you examples that couldn't happen. So if we look at this chart, the impact of buying just one rental property, um, assuming in today's market, it's a $200,000 rental, which could be a three bedroom, simple house. If you put 5% down and we're assuming 3.75% in your interest rate. Now that's, I think a little bit higher than it is today. Um, you'd be looking at a monthly payment, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and HOA. So your total monthly payment of about $1,200. In today's market, that home would likely rent for about $1,700 a month. So right away, you'd have positive cash flow of $500. Now, I wanna make it clear when we're actually looking at this example for that first year, you'd actually be living in the house because the best way to buy a house to then convert to rental property when you're starting out is to buy it and live in it for a year. You get special programs that are available to you as a first time home buyer and as an owner occupant that aren't available to you if you're a landlord just wanting to buy an investment. So if you look at this chart and you put 5% down, 5% of $200,000 is $20,000. So right off the bat, you have about $20,000 worth of equity in the house. Each year, the we factor that the monthly payment's gonna go up, but it's only gonna go up a very small amount. That's because the principal and interest are fixed. Only the taxes, insurance, and HOA components are gonna go up. So at a 4% per year increase on that, after 10 years, your monthly payment's gonna be about $1,300. But as you can see, the rent you know, will likely go up at 4% a year to about $2,300. So that puts you at about $1,000 a month positive cash flow. What's really exciting about that is not only are you making $1,000 a month in income at that point, but you've banked about $125,000 in accumulated equity in that property. As you can see, that, that gap grows each year at the 20-year mark. It's much more substantial. And then at the 30 year mark, as you'll notice, the monthly payment actually went down in this illustration, because at that point, it's illustrating only taxes, insurance and the HOA, because this is going to assume that you probably don't want to refinance out of your really low interest rate mortgage, and you're going to hold it that 30 years. So after 30 years, you're going to have almost $4,500 a month in rental income. That's net after you pay your expenses and an accumulated equity of potentially $650,000 in that one single property. So for those of you that are wondering, well, if we buy and hold rental property, what's the real impact to us? Some people ask me, well, how am I gonna fund my retirement? Because pensions just aren't a thing anymore. And who knows if social security will be around? Well, what we can assure you is that housing will still be around. And this is a fantastic way to begin to build wealth in this process. I'm gonna turn it over now to Steven to talk a little bit more specifically on, on how this strategy works and the moving parts inside of it. Steven, I appreciate your uh, taking over. All right, uh, great information, great insight, Rob. Um, so yeah, so in my world, um, there's a couple different ways to buy a rental property. Um, one, which Rob alluded to was first buying a primary residence. So this is talking to somebody who uh, does not, is renting right now, or is a first time home buyer, uh, for as little as three or 5% down, you can buy a new home. Uh, Rob and his team can obviously help find you the right one that uh, meets your needs and, and might be a good potential rental for the future. Um, we wanna use a conventional loan for this, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, they have more favorable guidelines when converting, uh, when planning to convert to a rental. So um, as Rob said, this is a 12 month strategy um, because a lot of this is based on your intent at closing. So if you go to buy a house and you have no intention of ever living in it and you already have a tenant lined up that's gonna rent it, that does not fit this strategy. That's buying a investment property. That's a whole different program. This is buying a primary residence where you intend to live you will occupy it within 60 days of closing. You will get your mail there. You plan to live there for at least a year. 
obviously life happens. If a job transfer happens or a um, marriage or a divorce or a life event, then all bets are off. But everything's based on your intention at closing. Uh, so this is the strategy number one is to buy the property as a primary residence. And then if we'll go to the next slide, we can talk about the conversion. Um, when you convert your house, you uh, can use that potential rent to uh, use as income towards the next purchase. So in order to do that, you would have to have a lease, a security deposit, and then you would have to have a little bit of reserves because you're going to now be having, you know, in this theory, you're going to keep your current primary home and then buy a new house to live in. And you're going to convert your current primary to a rental. So you're going to have two mortgages. One's going to be paid by somebody else, which just reinforces all the numbers that Rob just went over. Um, so to do that from a lending standpoint, we want to make sure that you have a little bit of reserves because in a worst case scenario, you know, you may have to cover a note payment in between renters. So a lender is going to want to make sure that you can cover that obligation. Um, FHA is another loan program that first time home buyers use, but they have more strict guidelines when converting. You, the, the property number two has to be 100 miles away and property number one has to have 25% equity. So just not as favorable um, when you can use a conventional loan for three or 5% uh, down. And a little disclaimer at the bottom, these guidelines do change. So this is based as of today, 126, you know, 2021. Um, we'll, we do a good job of keeping everybody up to breast on the guidelines, but as of right now, this is definitely something that could be on the table for anyone who's interested. Um, the next slide kind of reinforces the, the repeating the process and how that might work. Um, so again, in theory, this is every 12 months. Uh, if you were to choose this, um, you would have to have a primary residence for 12 months and then you could convert it. Fannie and Freddie, they allow you to have 10 loans at a time, not property. So if you were to make this, you know, a, a big portfolio and started paying off loans by your rental payments and such, uh, then you can own more than 10 properties. You just can't carry more than 10 loans. And in my world, there's always an exception, which most worlds, so there's always exceptions to these rules, but this is the, you know, the vanilla um, guidelines that we go by. And then just to make a note, every time you were to add a loan or add a property, you know, it requires more reserves. Um, we see a lot of times uh, spouses partnering up with other couples or business partners uh, joining forces. So there can be up to four individuals on a conventional loan when buying a, um, a, an investment property. Uh, so just wanted to make a note of that. And then a lot of the questions I get is, can I use the LLC? In the conventional world, you cannot because um, it's based off social security numbers, not, not tax ID numbers. There are non-conventional loans that we'll talk about later that do allow you to close in the LLC if that's something that, that interested you. And that's, again, for somebody that's buying an investment property as a landlord, not using the conversion pr uh, process. So um, calculating rent payments is income. Um, this is some in underwriting guidelines. And I just wanted to kind of hit on this briefly because it's something that comes up a lot is, well, how does this work for me? So um, in the chart on the left where it says, if the borrower, this would be you. So if you currently own a principal residence and you have had a, a at least a one year history of receiving rental income, then you can use that rent, 75% of it as income towards your next purchase. Now, most people on this call might be the next category where they might own a principal residence, but they have never had a rental. Okay, so for this example, you can then use the rental income to offset the payment for the next one. And then the bottom one is does not own a principal residence, does not have a current housing expense, then, you know, the rental income could not be used, you'd have to first buy a house. So you have to become a homeowner, wait the 12 months, and then you can use that income to offset your payment. Or if you have a year's history, you can use 75% of that rent towards your income on your next purchase. Um, and to verify this, when we do appraisal, you're charging somebody a, a um, exorbitant amount of rent and, and they've agreed to it, but it's not common for the area, then the appraiser will, will kind of adjust that. And we as lenders, we're going to use the lower of the two. So we're going to use whatever is considered to be fair market rent or the lease you have in place. And that's just a checks and balance that all lenders are gonna have um, when you're going through that process. 
Uh, duplexes, triplexes, and multifamily. Um, these are unique properties. Um, I, I own a duplex. It's it's a great revenue producing uh, entity for me. I never lived in it. I bought it as a landlord. So um, if you're looking to buy a multi-unit property uh, and live in one of the units, um, all the loan programs except USDA will allow that. Um, these are unique programs, which unique in the mortgage world means case by case basis. Um, so if you're interested in this, I'd love to talk one on one because it gets pretty detailed and I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts on that. But um, same thing as before, when you're looking at this stuff, you're always going to want to have a 12 month lease in place. So if you're buying a, a quad plex, for example, and there's three leases already in place, we're going to want to see those leases. We're going to see what the rents are. Are they fair market? And then the operating income statement to make sure that the, the prior owner was, was matching those numbers. So um, multi-unit is a great way to generate revenue uh, in this portfolio type of system. So just let us know if you have any specific questions about that, because uh, it does get a little bit detailed. Stephen, I'll jump in with one note that I, I went to a meeting last week with the Charlotte Mecklenburg um, Development and Planning Commission. And Charlotte and Mecklenburg County specifically are making a concerted effort to increase the availability of duplex, triplex, and quadplexes in the county. And in fact, there is a proposal on the table that is expected to pass now that by 2023, all residentially zoned properties will be eligible for duplexes and triplexes, uh, period, without restriction, uh, except for wow. potentially HOAs. So we're starting to see a real movement of county government looking to support these kind of properties. And I think this is going to be a tremendous opportunity for investors. And we as lenders um, usually follow suit with what's best for everybody. So, you know, a one unit to a four unit is considered a single family residence. Um, the reason we don't do a ton of them is just what you mentioned, Rob, there's just not a lot out there. And the ones that are out there are usually secured for, for long term purposes. So as we see more of these coming to the market, um, this would be a great thing for, for people to look into and would love to have any conversations and, and help anyone that's interested for sure. Great. Um, I did wanna to touch on buying an investment property directly. So this is somebody that's not gonna live in the house or um, you know finds a deal that they don't wanna live in, but, but could be a rental property. 20% is the minimum investment. But if you'll see in my notes, if you can put down 20% based on right now today, your rate would be half percent lower. So you're like, well, that doesn't seem like a, a lot. So just to put some numbers to it, on a $250,000 purchase price, you would put down an extra $12,500. You would save one hundred and three dollars per month, which would go straight to your profit. That's That would be instant revenue. And then most of the time people buy investment properties, not to buy and sell in a year or two, but as Rob mentioned, as their retirement plan, as their portfolio. So you got to look at this on a long-term big, big picture scale. If you were to hold this loan for 30 years, um, it's going to save you $26,704 in interest over the life of the loan. So it would almost, you know, more than double uh, what you'd have to put down today just on the interest in the loan. Some, some people look at doing shorter terms on these um, rental properties because, again, the goal is to have somebody else pay it down as quick as possible so that it's just purely cash flowing. Uh, in today's world, with the COVID, you know, shutting down so many different people and things like that, you know, having multiple revenue streams is key. So, um, you know, if you can have multiple properties producing multiple revenue streams, just strengthens your individual portfolio. Um, buying an investment property with a non-conventional loan. Uh, and just real quick, if you have good credit and um, are putting down the 25%, these investment rates are in the mid to low threes right now. So they're, they're extremely low, all-time lows. Um, so you know, right now would be a great time to lock in the lowest interest rate in history on an investment property or a personal property and, um, and take advantage of that because we do know at some point they're going to have to go up just, just for the market that we're in. Um, and for uh, other options that are non-conventional lending, there's hard money. Now, again, uh, with risk comes reward to the, the bank or the entity. So they're going to charge you a higher uh, interest rate. Um, so hard money, there's it's kind of a no questions asked. I don't, I don't do that. I'm a conventional lender, but they're out there. But you're probably talking to 8 to 10% type of interest rate. 
um, non-conventional lenders. So kind of in between what I do and hard money and their rates are gonna be, you know, five to 8%, uh, but they'll, they'll give you, um, they'll allow you to have different options than, than just not the, the conventional world. Uh, Finance of America is a company that I know of and have done some business with. And if you have questions about this, I'll be glad to go in more detail. Um, if you come into some cash by chance, uh, you can buy a rental property cash and then we can give you a refinance and pull 75% back out. Um, some people call that the rent refi repeat cycle. So you buy it, you get it rented, you pull your cash out and you know you keep that money moving. Um, Self-directed IRA. If you have an IRA currently that's not doing much or you're, or you're a little bit scared of the market, um, I actually, one of my IRAs owns a property. Uh, the, the money has to go back in the IRA and you, you have the same rules as far as age and things like that. But there's a lot of different ways to take uh, the options that are favorable to you or that you have in your wheelhouse and, and try to purchase property if that's something that's advantageous to you right now. So just wanted to kind of touch on different things that I don't offer personally. A lot of these I've used, um, but just figured it would kind of go roll right into this presentation for everybody. Mm -hmm. Great, Stephen, thanks for, for clarifying a lot of those things and talking about these programs. I know there's a lot of myths and disinformation floating around, either you know people hear it on the streets in a Facebook group or, you know, and, and it's really good to have someone that really knows what they're talking about to, to be able to clarify some of these things. Um, and I did just want to do one disclaimer. I'm one lender, and this is my opinion on some of this. So sure. if you talk to somebody else or you read something else, you may hear different information. The internet is full of that. So what I'm telling you guys is what I know and what I understand and uh, my opinion and, and some of the facts that we underwrite these files. So uh, just want to kind of throw that out there as a, a small disclaimer. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Well, we have come to the end of what we wanted to present today. And at this point, um, we are open to taking some questions. So we're gonna take just a minute and, and check to see what kind of questions we have accumulated either via Zoom or on Facebook Live. So bear with us for a second. Rob, I had a question come in. Okay, go ahead, Casey. Um, Steven, when you said, um, on the, I think it was the second slide, the, you need six months reserved for your primary and two months reserved for uh, the new rental or the new property. Does that, is that strictly cash or do lines of credit count? Um, great question. So uh, lines of credit, meaning credit cards do not count. Those are viewed as liabilities, not assets. So, but what does count is, is non-liquid. So this could be money in checking, savings, money market, stocks, bonds, CDs, IRAs, 401ks, pensions, annuities, um, but it, it would not be, you know, I could cash advance my credit card 10 grand. That Anytime you create debt um, to bring an asset into the picture in the lending world, uh, it's not a favorable thing for us. So that is a great question. Um, and I also wanted to point out that's also PITI. So that's the principal interest taxes, insurance, and any HOA association. So that's the total payment you have to um, have a, a calculated and, and verified and sourced uh, with us. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Great. Casey, do we have any other questions to crude? Um, one came in and asked, why do they require more money down for strict investments? Um, that's a great question. And that goes back to simply risk. Uh, and so this is as simple as I can put it. Um, if you own two houses and one of them is your primary and one of, is, one of them is an investment, your renters were to leave in the middle of the night and then all of a sudden you lost your job the next day, which payment are you going to make? It's the one where you sleep. So for that reason, it requires a little bit more skin in the game because if things were to become unfavorable for you, then you're going to take care of you and your family, which anyone would do the same. But as a lender, we just need to have a little bit of, uh, of more skin in the game. And there may be other reasons, but that's what I was always taught. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. All right. We'll just give it one more minute, see if any other questions came rolling in. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's watching, whether you're on Zoom, Facebook Live, or watching this on a recording. 
our goal in putting these together is to create um, an educational environment where people can learn things about real estate, learn how to uh, use real estate to leverage it to their financial freedom. Uh, we love to help people find a place to live and make a wise financial decision at the same time. Um, we would love to help you find your next home, whether that be an investment property, uh, your forever home, or that, uh, you know, a home in the middle. Um, we are very skilled at helping people win bids in a crazy market environment that we have right now. Um, and we're very good at helping people list houses and get the maximum dollar for them. Uh, in fact, there's two uh, market condition statistics that came out just today that I felt like I wanted to share. Um, in in a normal times, a balanced real estate market means there's six months worth of inventory, which means if at any given time, the amount of houses for sale would take six months to sell them all at the rate that they're going. Uh, we have just hit an absolute low ever in the Mecklenburg County area, the Charlotte market. Um, and it is down to 2.3 weeks of inventory. Um, in fact, right now there's only 722 active listings in, in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. Um, and last month over 2,400 houses went under contract. So as you can see, we are in, in a real interesting inventory market. So if you are thinking about making a move, this is certainly a great time to sell a piece of property and interest rates make it a fantastic time to buy one as well. We would love to help you with that. Last chance for any questions? Actually, we do have one more. Oh, um, we have one more come in. Stephen, I think this will probably be more towards you. Um, credit and lending wise, is there an advantage to two or more smaller properties versus one larger property? And when the return is equal, when the return is equal? Are you muted? There, sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Sorry. Are you one second? All right, Stephen, we're having a little uh, audio problem there, so I'll pass the question along. Um, the question that came through is, is there an advantage to having two smaller properties versus one larger property with roughly the same dollar amount? Did I get that question right? Um, when the return is equal. If the return is roughly equal. Um, I mean, I can speak to that to some extent. I think that the real issue is uh, availability of investment property um, is one issue. Uh, whether what the actual returns are on each property based on what you're putting into it and the rent that you're getting. Uh, and also the risk. Uh, there are certain situations where lower property values can potentially carry higher risks, uh, higher turnover of tenants, more maintenance costs, things like that. Yeah. Steven? And that's where I was going to kind of go from the lending standpoint. That there's not, it's, it's more of a personal preference. And, and a lot of the times, what I'm doing together, doing is putting together a puzzle for, for you and it's different from you for them and them. So there's no right or wrong answer, but um, as somebody who owns multiple rental properties, you know, the more that you have, the more, the more tenant problems you're going to incur and the more maintenance that you're going to occur. So one property is one set of problems, two is, is two. So if it were exactly the same and you could make a thousand on one or 500 on two, you know, it would maybe benefit you to take the one and work towards the second, but without, without being able to analyze the difference in option one versus the option two, it's hard to really tell, but I, nothing jumps out at me that would just make that a, a slam dunk answer for either side. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe if you got two, you could get a package deal. That's kind of where my mind goes, but um, uh, you know, okay. if you have specific properties, please reach out to us and we'd love to go over that with you. Absolutely. Stephen, um, there's another question that's come in from David. Um, it's a, one of my favorite questions in today's market is how can we beat cash buyers in this market? And David, that's a fantastic question. Um, there are a number of ways to be competitive. Um, it, it, when you go up head to head against cash and they're willing to pay the same amount you're willing to pay, that's pretty hard to beat. Uh, so what we have to do is figure out ways to get creative uh, and aggressive with offers. And I don't wanna to go too deep into this because there's so many different ways to do it. But if you work with a skilled realtor, whether it be myself, Casey, or someone on our team, 
between the way you structure the offer, um, the terms of the contract, those can all be very attractive. And at the same time, having a fully underwritten pre-approval is really crucial. And Stephen, I'll ask you to talk to what the difference between a, a quick pre-qual and a pre-approval is. Yeah, great question. Uh, so one thing personally that I do in that scenario um, is, well, let me back up one step. Once you apply, uh, we don't just look at your documents or take your word for, for you know, your income or your employment. We verify all this stuff. So basically our job in this market is to have you fully underwritten minus the contract, which the contract involves the appraisal, the title work, the insurance, you know, address specific items. So you as the borrower, we get your borrower approval as quick as possible. So if you're going up against a cash offer, the first thing I'm going to do as the lender is put together a pre-approval letter, give that to Rob, and that's going to be on top. Depending on the situation, we might also have you write an emotional letter uh, to try and tug at some of the, the strings of the seller if, if that matters. But what I'm going to do is call the listing agent and tell them how strong of a client you are. Tell them that you've already done your due diligence. Tell them that you will close. So that way, you're almost just as good as a cash offer. A lot of cash offers come from investors. So if you're talking about buying this house as a primary residence, sometimes that holds a little bit more weight in the eyes of the emotion. So we want to make your offer almost as strong as cash. And that's where my myself and my team, you know, get, do all of our due diligence as quick as possible so that in this market, you you truly have the golden ticket to make that offer and, and they, they know that it will close. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And, and to, to that point, Stephen, there are lenders around that are offering clients pieces of paper that say pre-approval at the top. But if you read the language in it, it says, based on the income you told me um, and your credit score, you should be approved for this house. Um, and that is not adequate when you are competing against cash or other, other uh, aggressive and fully underwritten pre-approvals. So be very careful if you're not working with a lender like Stephen. All right, we have a question from Tech Todd. What are your thoughts about a management company to manage the properties? Um, I'll speak that real quick and then Stephen, I'd love your input on that. Um, in general, a management company to manage properties is costly. Um, now, it's not going to change the numbers that we put in there to a degree where you, sh you, know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be attractive to do it. Uh, but if you're paying eight to 10% per year of the rent to a management company, um, it definitely eats into your profits. On the flip side, if you are not someone that wants to be a landlord, uh, someone that's not handy to you know, fix things around the house and someone who doesn't want to collect the rent from people, then a management company is a very valuable thing to have uh, because it prevents you from having to do some of those things. Stephen, what's your experience? Um, same exact thing. And, and, and personally, um, I use a management company um, mainly just because when I put this business plan together, I don't have the time. So it's more of an opportunity cost thing for me. Uh, if I can build in the numbers and, and hire a professional to do what they're good at, which is manage the properties, collect the rents, take care of the problems. You know, I'm not going to get a call at midnight, one, two, three in the morning because the pipes burst. Okay. The next day I'll get an email letting me know what happened. That's what that's worth it to me. So who's getting started that may have a little bit more time that can save that eight or 10% and, and doesn't manage, doesn't mind managing it it's all for it. A lot of my friends that are in this sector manage their own property. So um, I think that's more of a personal preference, but it really comes down to the opportunity cost of what's more important, you know, more profit or freedom and, and more time to do something else. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of good local companies. Uh, I'm sure Rob knows a few too. So if people have specific questions, I would direct that to them because uh, that's their profession and that's what they do day in and day out. And in each particular situation, we'll sit down and, and go through these questions and consult with people to try to help them determine the best thing for each of them. And, and it can change too. You might be just fine managing one or two properties. And by the time you hit four, you're pulling your hair out. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. All right. Well, it sounds like we are coming to an end uh, at this point. Um, let's see, we have oh, one, had one more question, question come in, it looks like. For houses that have yet to hit the MLS or coming soon, I'm considering to make an offer, but the seller is missing the residential property disclosure. 
it is best to wait and get that first before completing my offer. Um, that is a very good question. And I don't want to, um, in, if, if, this, if you have a real estate agent that you're working with, that person should be the one that counsels you on that. Uh, what I can tell you is there are a lot of houses being sold today before they go active in the MLS while they're still in coming soon status. Um, there are ways contractually for you to protect yourself if you don't have those disclosures. Uh, ask your real estate agent and they can help you with that. If you don't have a real estate agent, please call me when we're done here and I can explain more specifically um, how I would recommend you handle that. All right. We really appreciate all the questions and everything that you guys have uh, and, and the, the time and effort that you put into watching this. Um, Stephen, thank you very much for being our subject matter expert today. Again, this is the first of the monthly shows that the Walker Group is going to put on talking about real estate um, and various different things there. Um, next month, we will be hosting uh, a show that is about estate planning and your real estate and how they are related. And we look forward to seeing you next month. And uh, just reach out to us if you have any questions. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody.